गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वेलकम टू द लीडरशिप लेक्चर सीरीज टू थाउजेंड सिक्सटीन टू थाउजेंड सेवेंटीन आई वुड लाइक टू प्रेजेंट यू द गेस्ट लेक्चर फॉर टुडे डॉक्टर विक्रम राव रिसर्च ट्राइंगल एनर्जी कंसोटियम अ नॉन प्रॉफिट इन एनर्जी फाउंड बाई ड्यूक यूनिवर्सिटी नॉर्थ कैरोलाइना स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी आर टी आई इंटरनेशनल एंड यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ नॉर्थ कैरोलाइना इट शेपल हिल इट्स मिशन इज टू एल्यूमिनेट नेशनल एनर्जी प्रायोरिटीज एंड दोज ऑफ द वर्ल्ड माई एक्सटेंशन एंड टू केटलाइज रिसर्च टू एड्रेस दिस प्रायोरिटीज डॉक्टर राव एडवाइज द नॉन प्रॉफिट आर टी आई इंटरनेशनल वेंचर कैपिटल एनर्जी वेंचर्स ए एस एंड फर्म्स बायोलॉजिंग ग्लोबल एनर्जी टैलेंट लिमिटेड बायोडा टेक्नोलॉजी इंक मेलियो इनोवेशन इंक ऑफिस ऑफ एंड ईस्टमिन केमिकल्स कंपनी ही रिटायर्ड एज सीनियर वाइस प्रेजिडेंट एंड चीफ टेक्नोलॉजी ऑफिसर ऑफ हेलीबर्टन कंपनी इन टू थाउजेंड एट एंड फॉलोड इज वाइफ टू शेपल हिल नॉर्थ कैरोलाइना मेश इज वन ऑफ द यू एन सी फैसिलिटी फैकल्टी Later that, later that year, he took his current position. He is also past chairman of the North Carolina Mining and Energy Commission. Dr. Rao holds a bachelor degree in engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras, India, along with a master degree and a doctorate in material sciences and energy from from Stanford University. He is the author of more than 30 publications and has been awarded 40 U.S. patents, patents and foreign analogs. Uh, Uh, the title of today's talk is speeding innovation followed by a town hall town hall discussion on energy chat okay uh let's see uh, sound back yes i guess so. not too loud no so t- today i'm going to speak to you about uh, <coughs> my personal experiences in what i call speeding innovation uh basically it, well, i might go to the next thing uh We're going to talk about four things. Actually, I have decided we'll talk about a fifth thing, which is not on the slides, but uh, because it occurred to me when I thought about this this morning. I like to walk around, so oh, I'm sorry about that. But uh, the so these are the four things. So one is, if you innovate, in order to get any traction in the marketplace, innovating into the right space is important. So what is the right space? We'll discuss that. So. If you innovate into a space where people don't really want your product, then it becomes very difficult. So we will discuss what is innovating into the right space mean. What is how do you define the right space, and then what happens if you do that? Uh, we will discuss a little bit about first movers and fast followers. Uh, first mover is the first people to get there. Fast follower is they come immediately afterwards. Which is better? Okay. Uh, we'll discuss when it makes sense. So which is better? then disruptive technologies disruptive technologies is a term that was invented by uh, professor christensen at harvard and there's a book by him we'll discuss that it's an important concept uh, and i'll point out in which cases it's not a good thing okay it sounds like a good thing it sounds very spectacular but i'll point out when is it not a good thing and then finally we'll discuss intellectual property and i think i'll give you some insights that Uh, you might not have thought about before so these are the four things well there's a fifth thing which is not in the slide depends on the time but i think i will address it because it's very interesting now let me tell you right now that anything i'm speaking to you about i have used personally okay this is not theory anything that i have that i'm going to talk to you about i have used personally in some capacity either in the capacity of the board of directors of a small startup or in the capacity of uh, a vice president of a corporation uh, th- by the way those two things are very similar in one respect innovation is the same okay if you do it in a startup it's called entrepreneurship if you do it in a corporation we call it intrapreneurship but it doesn't matter the principles are the same whether it's in a major company or because not all of us not all of you can all do startups maybe you want to but it's not always feasible but almost everybody will be in some sort of enterprise and it can be done there you don't have to go to a startup to be inventive i have forty patents i was never actually almost never in a startup okay that one didn't do so well uh, so oh that didn't work uh let's go in the other way oh no okay so here's the concept of value migration it was invented by a guy called adrian slavatsky uh there's a book by him 1997 or so I'm pretty sure called value migration that's the name of the title basic value migration occurs 
So means value migrates, value moves from this part to the another space. It occurs when a customer priority shifts. We'll discuss what that means, okay? When there's a shift in the priority of a customer, in a buying habit of a customer. And when something new appears to serve it, if only the shifting happens, it's not good enough. The value has not migrated because nobody served it. So it has shift and something has to serve it. Those two things that happen uh, simultaneously, then value is migrated. Okay, and so it has migrated. How do you know it has migrated? One new way you know is that the buyer is prepared to share a higher percentage of the gain with you. You meaning you are the provider. The buyer is prepared to share a higher percentage again. So what is the higher percentage? In my experience, something really innovative, the most I have ever been able to charge is 50% of the value created. Okay? However the value is created, anytime you in innovate something, you figure out what is the value to the client. And on the basis of that, you adjust the price. Never make the price as a cost plus. You're leaving something on the table. We'll discuss a little bit more. And by the way, I like to operate in the following way. Anybody has a question, don't wait till the end. Immediately ask. Question or even comment. Short comment, okay? Uh, if it's only a comment. Uh, but interrupt me, okay? Because it works better that way. I never liked it when I sat in the audience and I had to write it down and wait afterwards. No, you just ask, ask now. All right, so, so the most I have ever been able to charge is 50% of the value created. Very difficult, by the way. 50 is the highest, and it is a bit unusual. So, so, but the point is, if you innovate in a space where the value is migrated, you will get a higher proportion of cost, which means your margins will be higher. Okay, that's that's the point. <clears throat> when value migrates, something is migrated out because that sector is being served by some service or product. The product that migrates out basically usually acquires what I call commodity status. What is the difference between commodity status and value status? Commodity status means the pricing is poor. Commodity status means the margins are poor. Okay, a commodity in the parlance means something that is not a high value. Okay, so when some value migrates, you serve it, something moves out, <coughs> that drops in value, becomes commodity. Here's an example. <coughs> Back in around 1936, this guy, I think this is it, yeah. So Texaco had a, had, a, had a petrol station, and at that time, the value was in the petrol, but also in the service. They changed the water, they put the air in the tires. It, it, in those days, it was what it's called? Service station. I think in this country, we still call it a service station. You don't get any service at the station. You just get petrol the, these days. We still call it a service station. Okay? Those days, it was a service station. That was the value. That where the value was. This is the same company, different name. And all the value is there, <laughs> is in this building here. It's not in the pumps. There is no profit in the gasoline. The profit is all in the chips and the cokes that people buy. So this is why almost every petrol station will have one of these things because that's where the profit is. So the value migrated from, long since migrated from serving petrol to uh, providing a service and then migrated to just giving it. So for example, I was, in a, I was giving a lecture <coughs> at a <coughs> company that provides those, uh, those card readers, credit card readers at the petrol pump. Okay. I don't know about you, but if they're not there, I'm not going to that place, okay? Because it's so convenient, okay? You don't have to go into the shop and be tempted by some candy or something, you know, anyway. Besides, it's more convenient and it's more safe, especially if you're in a dodgy area. It's safer to be able to pay right at the pump. So I was giving a lecture to those people and they'd invented it. And I said, so what did you get for the license fee for that? They did not understand it as an invention. They just thought it was a 
it was clever. And so here is an important point which we'll discuss later. The smartest people are the worst when it comes to detecting that it's an invention. Because the smartest people think, oh, it's obvious. Okay, the smarter you are, the worse you are in this respect. So in some cases, the, the good idea is truly an invention. In other cases, it's just something good to do. Those people, they left a lot of money on the table by not uh, patenting uh, that idea, uh, that device, which is the petrol pump uh, dispensing of money. One thing happens when, ma when value migrates is new suppliers may appear. Once value is migrated and the rec marketplace recognizes the value is migrated, People will come out of some, some small, usually small outfits will suddenly say, my goodness, I can do that. So if you're already in the space serving that market segment, be very careful because some small guy is going to come and supply something in the way that the customer now wants it as opposed to when they previously wanted it. And usually some new business design may be needed in order to serve that space. But the most important point is the one I made earlier, which is an opportunity to shift from what I call the cost world to the value world. And it, it, to be fair, most of the business world, when, when you go buy something, you probably say, I wonder how much it costs and I'm prepared to pay so many percent more than that. Okay? Those are usually for commodities. But for something with high value, you can go in the value world. Look for opportunity to change the pricing model when you do something really new. Yeah, I'll give you an example. The, so the filtration example is, let's say that you had a filter for filtering whatever, for filtering water or solids out of something, uh, and it's basically a filtration medium filled with some solid particles. And let's say you needed to be portable, so you decided to make the filtration medium super light with a low, low specific gravity. It's good. It's a great product. You can move it around. Same filtration qualities, but it's lighter. But you discover that filtration medium is sold by weight. Boom. There goes your profit. Because you made a better product, but the nature of the pricing mechanism is acting against you. Because you are now forced to sell. If it's sold by weight, then you are forced to sell a high value product for a lower price, effective price, because it's forced by weight. Do you understand? So if you're a market leader, you're in a position to say, we'll change the, and I have done that, you, we will change it and we will be, we will be pricing by volume, uh, by liters, not by kilogram. Not always possible, but be careful. You may innovate yourself into a poor profit margin because of the nature of the pricing mechanism. The other interesting example, of course, everybody knows the razor blade model. You know, it's a model of, uh, you know, in, in razors, they pretty much give away the razor and charge a heck of a lot for the blades. So that's a very common, Gillette invented it originally idea. Now in business, it's called the razor blade model. When you deliberately almost give away something in order to charge a lot for the spare parts, essentially spare parts, okay? So, and that's an example of an idea of a clever way where you don't have, you just innovating on the pricing model is the innovation. So here is a, so I'm going to discuss with you Christensen's hypothesis. Uh, Christian, same guy who invented the idea of disruptive technologies, he basically said without proof in this article in Harvard Business Review in, in 04, that if you look at a value chain, from beginning to end, start with the raw material and you end with an object. He says that chain can tolerate a certain amount of total profit. And along the way, there are suppliers of the various parts. What he's saying is if along the way, the supplier of something drops to commodity status, which means that their margins drop, you have an opportunity for higher margin in other part of the chain. That's what he's saying. He's saying the total margin for the chain is constant. And it makes sense because this object has certain value. The people are prepared to pay for it. They don't know what in, in between parts are. So he, he's, he offered that. I have used that. So he offered it without proof. Although somebody told me he wrote a book based on that. 
I don't know. But in, in my own business, I've used that. I observed that in the chain, the margin had dropped for one part. So I said, okay, we have an opportunity, let's innovate in that space. And that actually worked. Uh, <clears throat> so th th this is the sort of general sort of thing. So now let's talk about first mover advantage. We all know what a first mover is, okay? The first people to get out there. In a conservative industry, it's not always a good idea. Why is that? It is because <clears throat> a conservative industry, whichever that might be, if it's conservative, they are slow on the uptake. It takes a long time for it to settle in, the idea to settle in that this is an improved product. During that time, this is what I call a gestation time, you deplete cash. If you're a startup and there's a long gestation period before, uh, before you get volumes, you may not survive. The big problem with startups is cash flow. And so you may not survive long enough. So first mover may be disadvantage if the uptake is not fast enough. Okay. Now there's the if <coughs> sorry uh, if you if you are if you if you are in an migrate if you're in an area that value is migrating the chances of up to faster uptake is greater. So this fits with value migration as well. Okay. But here's the interesting thing: patenting can preserve the rights. So first movers can prevent the fast follower through effective patenting. And this can be done. Now, uh, this is a good examples of that. So, the w one example. Intel. Intel is essentially a monopoly. So, how come? By the way, the, the, there was a monopolistic case brought against them and the government failed on that one. But they are a monopoly. So, what, what, what did they do right? First of all, they did very, very good patenting. Okay. Next thing they did was, whenever advanced micro device, there wasn't really any one worthy uh, successor, AMD. By the way, I don't know about right now because I don't watch that space. But most of the time, since the last 10 years at least, AMD chips are just as fast, just as good as Intel. But Intel gets more price. So what's going on? What's going on is brand, brand value. Uh, in fact, I was working for a company once when we got bought. We had a very high profile, okay, very high profile. We were considered the best in that sector. Right after we got bought, many of my people left uh, for a number of reasons. And <clears throat> so our product actually suffered. And yet, for over two years, if you took a survey of the marketplace, they would say Sperison was number one in quality, which is not true. Okay, brand survives, not forever, but if you can get the brand, it will hold you for some time, whatever that is. In our case, it held for over two years and uh, we were able to, to come back. With Intel, what they did was more than that, they did aggressive pricing. Every time AMD came out with something that was chip as fast as them, they dropped the price. Because they were ahead, they could do this, because by that the, the, uh, chips are very, very capital intensive, you know, uh, to build. So by the time you have the capital build for the plant, uh, <coughs> their costs have dropped, but they're not passing on that to the customer until AMD came. AMD came the chip just as fast as Intel. Intel dropped the price. AMD is killed. So this went on, still going on. So advanced macro devices, which makes really good stuff, doesn't matter. Intel was the fuck was first there and fast follower was fast slow nothing uh, followers just failed to get the same margins okay so that is a case where uh, it is good to be in the front but you know uh, so th th then you got a situation like texas instruments okay ti they happen to in their patents they set a standard now what do you do okay Setting a standard means you're doing something in a way that if you allow others to also do it, basically like PCs, the opposite of what yeah, Apple did. By the way, what Apple did, which is to maintain all the software within themselves and not have an open source, I thought wouldn't work, so I was wrong. Okay, But that's very rare, uh, very rare. You, you're much better off being open source 
and having a lot of people innovate rather than you yourself. Uh, they almost failed on that, but how can you argue they're succeeding? But, uh, <clears throat> but IBM said, PC, we will make it available to everybody. Okay. So DI actually was one of the first people on semiconductors, Texas Instruments. And they had a platform. If they were the only ones making semiconductors, they felt that there was not enough profit to go around. So they heavily licensed, and they made their money on licenses. You know, ultimately, TI chips were, were not very good, but the licenses were the revenue came. Okay, so there are all kinds of, so if you're first, you can succeed. But I personally prefer to be a fast follower, because somebody else already created the market for you. See, I like to actually say that uh, the people in the front get shot, which is true, okay? Uh, uh, and they take all the blows to create the market. Uh, and a fast follower, unless there's patent problems, the fast follower will succeed in general. So disruptive technology, this concept was introduced by Bauer and Christensen. There is a book called uh, Innovator's Dilemma. Don't bother with the book. Yes. Yeah, so the conservative industry, one, a good example is the one I came from, which is oil and gas. Uh, they, uh, new things, in, in fact, there is almost a, a, a statement that they make in Texas, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? If it's not broken, don't fix it, okay? Uh, so they are making their margin, not much, but they're making their margin, they don't want to move from it. it it's almost like nobody can criticize me for not changing, Somebody criticized me for taking the risk and doing the wrong thing. And I think that many, iron and steel is a conservative industry. I mean, for, for a long time, iron and steel did the old fashioned way until something interesting happened, which is the small mills, okay, uh, Nuco and so forth, uh, where instead of being, in fact, I have a lecture tomorrow in mechanical engineering called Just in Place Manufacturing, which talks about you, you, in many cases, it is, it, you are able to overcome economies of scale by making things small and heavily distributed, if it makes sense to do it. Uh, so steel is like that now. So iron and steel now, the most profitable iron and steel is relatively small production. You make the iron in a relatively small unit, immediately goes over to steel making, and you make the steel. Uh, those are the only truly profitable, the old blast furnaces and big steel mills, they are not profitable as much. So that's a conservative industry, but somebody did the change and now uh, it can follow, yeah. Yeah, so the book is called Innovator's Dilemma, don't buy the book. There is a paper by Bauer and Christensen Ah, I've given the reference. Harvard Business Review, 1995, the first issue, so January, February issue. In many cases, you'll find that the seminal paper is all you need. The book is the same idea repeated 15 times with examples, okay? Uh, smart paper doesn't have to, the, the paper came out in, in 1995 and I was using it in 1997, okay, using the concepts. And the concept basically is that it's almost definition that it's a want, that's not a want, but it's a need, okay? I got, I was give this same lecture in Gandhinagar, and this student said, but how can a want not be a need, or either way, we, we can't run. So it's, you're splitting a hair here, but basically, a need is something that is necessary, a want is something that is more in the head, okay? All right, so want and need not the same. A, a, a want you will pay for, a need you may not even know you have the need. So this is the difference, okay? And in the case of deceptive technologies, they, they don't feel they want it, but they need it. And because they're not sure they want it, it will not sell. So first lesson of deceptive technologies is people don't seem to want it. Then the second thing is, that is imperfect at first. Almost in every kind of time, a different technology is a poor product in the beginning. Okay, 
and it just takes time to become better. When it becomes better, it just replaces. This completely replaces what was before. The outstanding example of this hard disk and then the cell phone. I, I don't know if you remember the cell phone. You guys, of course, too young, but you have seen pictures. The first phones which are mobile were like bricks. They were this big. Okay, and then they got a bit smaller. But when the iPhone happened, it went to a pocket. Okay, it just killed, killed the rest. Motorola died. Well, that part of Motorola. So, a disruptive technology is one that nobody seems to want it, but by golly, when they see it, they want it, and then when they want it, just kicks out what it replaced. Hard disk is an important case, okay? Hard disk meaning the three and a half inch disk, okay? That was a major, they were very unreliable, costly, uh, pretty awful for a while, and then just blew out the, the, the big disks. So, so what, so that, that's good, right? Here's the problem. It requires, oops, sorry. It requires what I call disruptive behavior for success. It requires risk takers. It requires a, a cadre of people who are prepared to, 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 to go against what I call the orthodoxy of their company, okay? To go against the conservatism of their company. They're prepared to take that risk. So I had that happen. Uh, only two times. I only had the good fortune to work for on two disruptive technologies. But but when that happened, uh, it was pretty amazing when actually the switch happened. When somebody took the risk and uh, actually in that case what happened was our competitor uh, noticed it, had ignored what we were doing, but it completely changed the industry after this, these two kids in Shell took the risk. Kids meaning they were your age. I mean, they were, uh, they were bachelor's and master's degrees with a couple of years, of three years experience. So they were in the mid-twenties or something, you know. They took this risk and it, it changed the industry. Uh, then my competitor, main competitor followed and put a team together in six months, big team. They were a very big company. And in six months, they had caught up with us. But I didn't care. So here's another personal view. I don't care if I have a competitor. Actually, I don't care if I have two competitors. I care if I have 15. Okay, so why don't I care if I have one or two competitors? Because they help me to develop the market. If I am the only one developing the market, it could be slow going. In the example I gave you, the other guy, Schlumberger, was bigger and better than us, actually, as an overall company and they were more known for a technology company. So when they copied us, suddenly everybody thought it's okay. So our volume went up. And our volume stayed up because we were better, okay? But it went up because we had, you know, because we had the approbation of the people considered the leader. Uh, this could be my cell phone. Uh, I need it back, okay. I'll forget otherwise. Uh, uh, so, <clears throat> so in general, in fact, this guy Pallad or somebody has this called rule of three. And I sort of agree with that. The rule of three, basically, three compared is a good thing. Uh, much more than that is a problem. Uh, I'm not sure why I got into that space, but there it is. You'll see this is the way I work. Okay. So let's talk about intellectual <coughs> property strategies. When I talk intellectual property, I mean I mean patents. But intellectual property is more than that. Intellectual property can be trademarks, uh, can be copyrights, and can be other things. But for our discussion, it is patents. Something that most oh that green is horrible. Oh well, I hope you can see it. Well, um, something that most people don't uh, appreciate is that for a startup, the most important thing is this these words, freedom to operate. The most important thing is not how many patents you have. So what, what does this mean? Oh, having patents is good, I'm not saying it's not. It is that if you don't have freedom to operate, you're done. And so what is freedom to operate? Basically, 
the definition is is what you are doing infringing on someone's valid patent whether it's valid or not you can't tell in the beginning you have to assume it's valid okay there's anyway we won't go there are you infringing someone else's property if you are then you do not have the freedom to operate your own what you might think is an invention you don't have the freedom to operate uh, <clears throat> what we did in every place i have been did we verified this at every what we call milestone a milestone is basically initially when you agreed to do the project you come to a sp point at which uh you reach a go no go decision is it worth keeping on going or did something good happen at each of those milestones you verify because by then you have invented something you verify did you really invent it or are you by mistake copying someone we do that uh investors these days are very astute in that space so investors now know i i recently advised someone on a freedom to operate issue the invest uh on this sec on the series a round um uh, thought there was an if uh, freedom to operate issue in fact there almost was but then i worked on it and turned out it was okay uh but this is getting uh, getting sophisticated in this regard yeah uh, so so that's an issue the example of research in motion is outstanding okay this is blackberry people they did not learn this lesson they ended up paying about 700 million dollars in infringement cost they lost several cases and okay that's bad what really bad was it happened exactly at the time they were getting killed by apple and samsung okay so the timing was atrocious and fine i think president obama still uses a blackberry or something maybe he was the only one but the point is that the company suffered tremendously because of one mistake they did not their leadership did not understand about freedom to operate so they at any other time they would probably so 700 million is still a lot of money but they might have survived and they still sort of surviving but not really i mean who it's not going anymore okay well <laughs> oh by the way they were the first, they were the first to fall they were not followers they were leaders here's an example of a leader through one mistake because essentially i don't know number 4 or number 5 okay so what is the other aspect of it that your property the more the one you know about patents <coughs> owning patents so a patent is basically a legal right to prevent anybody else from using what you're doing for a period of time it was the idea of patenting was invented in the US uh congress decided that to give you a monopoly for a period of time so that at the end of that time others would be able to make it av available so because if you have a trade secret coca cola's <coughs> uh formula is a trade secret actually it's a trivial example but who cares about that trade secret i don't anyway uh well is law brand value though uh then innovation won't happen is the idea same idea about apple versus ibm okay so they felt that okay we'll give you a monopoly for a period of time but after that it's open the public will get it that's the idea of patenting for most startups who cares after 17 years okay by that time if you don't have a exit event then you're doing something wrong uh so patenting is a good thing okay so but cost effective patents patents are very expensive for after using foreign patents and all that it, it's over 200,000 US dollars per patent if you do a lot of foreign filing so it's a very expensive process you have to be very careful patent only the exact right things uh, <clears throat> and only wisely so i was advising a company uh, uh, recently i was at their board meeting and as an outsider and they gave a presentation where they very proudly said this is wonderful stuff and we have so many patents in 27 countries okay <clears throat> so i said uh, uh how many of these countries do you actually operate in right now so they said three so i they saw it coming i so i said okay so how many do you expect to operate in the next 5 years five 
So what are you doing with patent? Patent is basically protection against someone else copying you in that country. So what's the value of a patent in those countries? Now, zero. I mean, not zero, because you may go there sometime. Okay. So this is bad, bad advice from someone. They think more patents is good. It's not. More countries is good. It's not. Just be sensible. Patent in spaces that truly matter. So, for example, I did due diligence in a company. Well, any time I do it, but in one particular company in 1992, and which we were buying. Due diligence means when you buy a company, you go and examine whether they told the truth about everything. And uh, so I was examining. So the CEO comes to me and says, "How good is their patent portfolio?" I said, I haven't discussed, the, I haven't figured that out yet because I haven't talked to their marketing people yet. He said, well, what do you need to marketing? This is technology. I said, no. I said, you start with the sales and marketing people. You figure out what they are really good at. Where is their value proposition? And then you come back and see whether the patents cover what is valuable. A patent, if it does not cover the secret sauce of the company, the part of the company that creates the value, it does not have value for me. Fine, it's a nice number. We'll put it in there. But I always compare what is the edge of the company versus the portfolio. And so that's all that matters. So if you are a startup, you should patent a few patents in the areas that have maximum impact and a few countries where you are very sure. And then that's it. Anything more than that is a waste. <clears throat> the idea of platform technology is an interesting one. I, I have experienced this uh, three or four times. Sometimes the innovation is what I call a platform technology. A platform technology means a technology which can be applied to a number of vertical segments. Okay. Uh, when you have a platform technology and you are a normal startup. Normal startup don't have the bandwidth to be able to pursue five, six things simultaneously, or they shouldn't. Their board member should prohibit it. <clears throat> so you go f if you stay focused on a few things and do not pursue the other ones that the platform allows, you're leaving money on the table. So what do you do? So one of the tech one of the strategies I have is that you take the patent and on it, that you divide the patent. And each division, and I'm getting a bit patent technical, but that's, I'm sorry, but bear with me. Each division is claiming a different market segment. Each of those so-called divisions are separately patents, but they're much cheaper because the main body of the patent is exactly the same. The claims are a bit different for each one. So what is going on here? What's going on here is that what you should do is the stuff that you can't get to in the next 10 years, carve it out, license it. Let somebody else make money with it. Don't even try to make a great bargain on that. Just, just so, so what, what does that do? First of all, it gives you cash flow, all right? Because you get money for the patent before you get money from your own products. <clears throat> Second thing is you're monetizing something that you were not going to get to anyway. And the patenting strategy on that is this divisions, because the other alternative is that you license the omnibus patent, the big guy, with what's called rights in fields of use. And let me tell you something. A field of use of an omnibus doesn't feel the same as my patent. And that's the difference. So there are all kinds of these, these nuances of patenting that startups should be aware of. Uh, and that applies to non-startups as well. And I think that's the, uh, we just discussed that. So this is my last slide, summary slide. You, you should innovate into the right space. And in that, I want to throw in one more thing, which is societal acceptance of the innovation. Uh, the reason I mention that is because one of the things that I'm reasonably passionate about is uh, distributed power in villages, power for the off-grid situations. And the other thing is uh, uh, smokeless cook stoves, okay? because 
uh, cook stoves burning biomass is cause of about 2 billion, uh, some very large number of deaths due to PM 2.5 particulate matter, <coughs> which causes various diseases. So, uh, so if you, so these people actually devised a cook stove, chula, which was smokeless. Problem was that they took a 55 gallon barrel, cut it in half, and did something with it because it was cheaper or something, you know. Nobody wanted to buy it. And nobody wanted to buy it is because these people neglected to realize that just because you're poor doesn't mean you don't have aesthetics, okay? And these, uh, these people didn't want to buy it. So poor have aesthetics too, okay? People have to understand this, okay? And so this is societal consideration. And another example, the people I'm advising uh, are doing something with the Gates Foundation money on something which is called a waterless toilet. Okay, very interesting project. Anyway, so I will tell you what it is if anybody cares, but right now I won't, uh, meaning this instant I won't. Uh, and <coughs> so you put this waterless toilet in a village situation, you, come, you butt up against societal problems of that women are not prepared to go, for, for not prepared to go into a house, into, into this thing. They won't prefer to go in the field, and they will only go at night because of modesty, and then bad things happen. So the societal issue of whether the waterless toilet is a pr a applicable to a particular society is a is very much a social science issue. So we we engineers tend to think because we can, if we build it, somebody will come and buy it. Okay, doesn't work. Okay, M much of it is in other in the marketing type of issues, but in societal acceptance things in areas of interest to me, I've begun to realize quite a bit that social science issues really almost dominate, okay, uh, in, 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 in the acceptance. We discussed verified freedom to operate, and we discussed patenting. The last point is innovation in a business model may be as important as innovation in the technology. In fact, maybe more important. Uh, if you build something and then there is no mechanism in which to offer it, and actually I'm working on one thing right now, which is like that. Well, I'll tell you what it is. So it is, uh, there's a lot of pockets of methane being produced that is currently being burnt or let go, in fact. These include uh, uh, natural gas associated with oil production, but this amount is so small that you can't put a pipeline. This includes animal waste impoundments, uh, like swine and so forth, where <coughs> the biomass is all together and then you get, you get methane. So basically biogas, if you will. These are all very small quantities. In fact, that's my lecture tomorrow. Uh, <coughs> and small means what? Less than 500,000 standard cubic feet per day. You're all engineers, okay? That's nothing, okay? You can't build a plant with that. You can't build a plant with 5 million standard cubic SCF per day. So. So these people are working on a technology and it, it's going to work. I will present it in, in tomorrow in, in mechanical engineering department, I think it is. Uh, uh, that's working. But here's the interesting thing. For the application for flared gas, yes. which is the field application, the oil field, <coughs> where the gas has no way to get out, so they're flaring it. For that application, here's the problem. The oil company does does not want to run a chemical plant. They say, we don't understand chemical engineering, we don't want to understand chemical engineering, we don't want, uh, we don't want any assets that are chemical engineering assets. Uh, we drill, okay? The, then we have service companies. There are service companies who operate on these rigs who actually come and offer a service. They don't understand chemical plants either. In the industry, there are people who understand chemical plants. They call refineries, but they don't operate in the field. So you've got refiner, refiners who know, understand the technology, but don't operate in a field location of drilling. You've got drillers who don't understand that, so they have no vehicle. There's no company that you can license the technology to. So you have to innovate. You have to build a business model. Uh, how they will do that is another, it doesn't really matter. But the point is, in some cases, you do something that's really important. The World Bank 
made an assessment that 5.4 trillion cubic feet of gas is being flared like this every year. That's a lot. I mean, f forget anything. Forget, uh, forget the CO2 in the air. You got all the money being essentially burnt. <coughs> but this technology, there is no business, nobody to sell it to. So, I've done about that. <coughs> not quite lost my voice. And we. I may have. Five minutes we have questions. I will introduce you to another topic. And that is, <coughs> you can look it up. It's called information asymmetry. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a principle of economics uh, that won the Nobel Prize in 2001, I think. Uh, George Akerlof is the name of the Nobel laureate from Berkeley. And uh, the principle goes something like this. Actually, very easy to understand. Actually, the mathematics and all that, forget all that. It's easy to understand in principle. The principle goes something. The way he explains it, if I'm selling you a used vehicle, and if I give you all the information on it, it was repaired then, it, uh, all the maintenance information on it, you will set a certain value to it. If I sell you the same vehicle and give you no information, you will set a lower value. You will assume <coughs> it is a lemon, he calls it. You know, lemon is a car that's a bad, something is bad. He calls that the lemon discount. So in principle, what this means is that if the buyer and the seller have different levels of information on the transaction, whatever the transaction is, is devalued. So what is to be done? Okay. How do you bring up the, the information value? You could do that. You could provide brochures or 3D something, and that's one way. Okay. Provide ways in which to bring the information value of the buyer up to where they will value it. What I did uh, <coughs> in the uh, mid-80s, that disruptive technology happened. Things were not working properly. My clients were unhappy. Uh, they said, so we, I'm not getting the product sold. Then suddenly at one point, uh, it started becoming very uh, very reliable. Of course they didn't believe it. Right there. There was the asymmetry. I knew it was reliable. Plant didn't really know it was reliable. So what was to be done? Go and give them more lectures? No. So what did I do? I offered insurance. I said, I'll insure you. Okay. If it fails, your money back. It's not exactly the way it might work. So I offered insurance. For two years, 30% of my profit was from the insurance. 30%. So I solved the information asymmetry through a monetary means. By the way, after about two years, uh, client by client, they realized that they were paying too much for the insurance and that it was fine. And I was happy with that because they bought the product. And when Akerlof came and visited at Duke University and gave a lecture. I went up to him afterwards. It's very bold of me to do this. I mean, I'm a damn engineer. I'm not an economist. But I, I, I go up to him and I said, Professor Akerlof, I used information cement in this way. And you know what? He said, that's interesting. I've never seen it done that way. But in principle, I agree with it. So here's another interesting point, generally. If you see a principle in a field outside yours, don't be afraid to grab it. If you make a mistake, fine, so fix it. But don't be afraid to grab it. Uh, and with that, <coughs> let's, uh, I'm done, and we can talk about anything you want. Or we can talk about anything in energy, which is what I know about. This is all non-engineering stuff. But it's important. Uh, there's nothing I've talked to you about that I haven't used myself. So we can have questions about this or about any topic in energy, if I know anything about it. Just a chat. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, 
solar cell itself is a combination of different uh, engineering disciplines like yeah. chemistry i won't call it as engineering but there is some part of electrical engineering there is some casting and all those things if you think of a startup is it really required to have people from all those background or we can just focus on a single like material aspect yeah, you all got the question <coughs> very good question because here the answer to that question is you should fill a needs gap you should fill a white space don't try to make a better panel forget it the chinese are making it better than you are and cheaper okay uh, so fill a white space uh, and in that particular case that white space is being filled by one of your faculty members here right now uh, junjun wala because it, that that's something that I, i'm complete believer in the use of dc microgrids anyway you had a follow up uh, yeah yeah like uh, i won't talk in the context of india but in some of the universities they yeah. have been researching on the materials new yeah. materials yeah which are cost effective as well as high efficient yeah. highly efficient co com compared to the conventional silicon so should we like venture into the material aspect also which is like very competitive but at the same place it gives like yes and uh, the answer is yes should you venture into the materials aspect and the reason is a uh, higher yields okay so uh, so that w one would be uh uh photovoltaics uh, organic photovoltaics uh, would be a very interesting area it was started by professor in oxford uh, assistant professor there uh, what started uh, oxford Port photovoltaics okay, yeah the name itself is oxford photovoltaics they came up with a material which has been around for 4 years perovskite and they have came up for flexible application so and it's working pretty good like they are getting orders they have been uh, like companies like toshiba and all are putting in the money there yeah i, I think that <coughs> uh, 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 well is organic perovskite is actually a uh, a really essentially it's, it's, it's actually a natural min mineral but it's a mixed oxide uh, uh, yeah I, I think more efficient and flexible is very interesting because flexible means it can be wearable okay in the in the limit and wearable means not as your clothing but for the armed forces so uh, so yeah i i think that people shouldn't accept that because silicon panels are very cheap and available that's the only way to go uh, uh yeah, it is you if it's an application yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is you're probably opening up a migration issue migrate that issue uh, uh so no I, i don't think that we should cheap that we shouldn't work on alternative but we need at least some idea of which marketplace you're serving uh if you're trying to serve the same marketplace it's probably not a good idea then probably innovation should come what people like jinjinwa are doing with c microgrid okay so edison lost that battle with westinghouse because see is better for long distance transmission but ac is not the way to go now with solar which is dc and most things that we use are dc now so uh, so i will dc yes <coughs> uh, do we have any open source or freely available software for proper sizing of uh, solar photovoltaics and battery if i know my load profile or uh, how important is this sizing issue when it comes to the dc or ac microgrid and is there any work done on that okay so what i would suggest is and this is very important when anybody comes and talks to you is if they don't know they say they don't know but better they tell you where to go i would go to call okay she is uh, she is in in the same lab as junjunwala uh, her first name is uh, her last name is called k a u r yeah fine she will absolutely know the answer to second part of your question okay but the first part or not then she'll be able to find out but uh, i i would go to her i i am some sabir i i i know but last name is called k a u r <coughs> I mean, it's not afternoon. You can't be asleep. 
You, you know, when, when, when I was here, which was a long time ago, we had zero air conditioning in anything. Those classes from 1 to 4 uh, were uh, difficult. It is bad for us. We had these German professors coming from Munich and Aachen. <laughs> I remember Professor Koch. He was a little heavy man. Uh, not literally, he was a bigger guy, but he was heavy. <laughs> he had this handkerchief which was perpetually soaking wet. Because the poor guy was doing this with the handkerchief. He was doing nothing. <laughs> so there were fans somewhere, but it was not enough for him. Or survived. Sometimes fell asleep, but generally survived. Yes. <coughs> and it, yes. Uh, the oil and gas. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm from Ocean Engineering uh, okay. background. Uh, the oil and gas. But I'm going to speak that tomorrow. Yes, sir. Somewhere, yeah. So uh, it's uh, like going in losses uh, as we see. So wh how do you see the future of it? And do you think which uh, which, which one of the renewable uh, energy source would replace it in the near future? Okay. So <sighs> uh, there are two different issues on renewable energy. One is electricity, and the other is the transport fuel. Completely different. Okay. Electricity has a much better shot on renewables than transport fuel. First of all, right away I'll say, okay. Uh, uh, in transport fuel, which is basically oil gas, first of all you said they're not making any money, are they in trouble? Uh, uh, the answer is no, essentially no, why now? Okay, in fact I, I have lectured on this. Uh, it, an in industry that is threatened innovates. So I am expecting the innovation to pick up dramatically among the survivors. So basically, in the, in the oil and gas companies, and pretty much ga gas is what it is, but oil companies, about one third are going to die. Die means they'll be picked up by one of the, the other one other two thirds. Other, one one third is so strong, Shell and Chevron, they're not going anywhere. In the middle of these companies that have three years to survive, three years, uh, and in those three years, there's going to be a lot of innovation. I expect the actual cost of production of oil to drop by at least 30 percent uh, within two years, three at the maximum. <coughs> if it does that, then their break-even cost goes down and they'll survive. So from the standpoint of the oil companies, from the standpoint of the U.S. and India, which are net importers, and China. From a standpoint of a net importer, these low prices are good. Okay, and so the best scenario in my mind, prices stay low, but the suppliers stay alive, and we get into a new, uh, uh, new paradigm of perpetually low to medium oil price, that the producers are still making a profit, uh, but we, the consumer is benefited from. Uh, uh, from low prices. Okay, that's one thing. Now, replacement. <coughs> In fact, I was speaking with two or two faculty members today, uh, Satya Chakravarti and Junjanwala, about replacement. Most, more, more Satya. Uh, uh, the, uh, because that's combustion engineering. Uh, basically, in my view, there are two replacements. Displacements. They're not replacements because they're not going anywhere. Okay. Displacements. One is methanol and the other is dimethyl ether. Dimethyl ether is CH3 or CH3. You all had chemistry, right? So just deal with it, okay? Uh, the, and the, double, the bonding is going through the oxygen. So because the bonding is going through the oxygen, uh, when you burn it, there is no soot. There's soot only when carbon-carbon bonds, bonds break. Okay, this is just a fact of chemistry. So dimethyl ether can blend with diesel up to at least 20% without changing the engine. And then similarly, uh, get, uh, methanol uh, in uh, gasoline. So China is doing a lot of that, the second one, uh, methanol and gasoline. <coughs> so, and then we do clever things, okay. What is clever? More of an answer than you wanted, well, what the hell, okay. Uh, what is clever is that fuel injection, everything is fuel injected now. So my wife drives a Mazda right now. Uh, which has 13 compression ratio. I don't know how many of you even know what it is. You know what compression ratio is. Somebody, no, you don't. Okay, basically you have a cylinder 
the gas cylinder, you put the fuel in, and you compress it. And then you fire it. And we fire it, it goes up and drives things. <clears throat> the more you compress, the more energy is produced when you fire it. So higher compression is better. Okay. But if you compress too high with the low octane gasoline, then it will prematurely ignite. Okay. Before you put the spark. So, so, I comp so the normal cars are 10, 8, 9 compression ratio. This is 13 compression ratio. Which is like a sports car. Uh, she's not driving a sports car. It's a sedan. Okay. With normal gas. How did they do that? So I looked into it. I don't know what they're doing, but I think what they're doing. I know what they're doing. They are fuel injecting uh, two, two times. So the reason that the premature ignition happens we can be engineering what's speeding in a way. Anyway, but the reason compression, uh, uh, the premature ignition happens is the temperature goes up with friction. If you cool the thing down, that's good. Okay. So what they I think doing, they got they got uh, thermal sensors. They start get temp temperature goes up. They shoot more gasoline in. And when gasoline goes in, you get evaporation. Evaporation is cooling. So we're letting it evaporation. Okay, so I think that's what's going on. So they're able to get with regular gasoline, compression ratio of 13. Gas mileage goes up by 35 percent, by the way, when you do that. Because anytime you can get the same amount of gasoline or energy, then your gas mileage goes up. That is, I think, the future of replacement. So the same thing. You do it with methanol. Methanol has uh, three times the latent heat of evaporation, you look it up, it's around three times. Of gasoline. So whatever cooling effect you get, imagine how much you would get in methanol. And you can inject methanol. No. Okay. Yeah, I might thought of this, not me thinking about this. <coughs> but nobody does it. Okay. Even in China, they're just replacing, uh, they blend. The correct thing to do is to using the evaporation and stuff like that. So, Short answer to your question is, I think portions of transport fuel will be replaced, but only portions, um, and with methanol, which can be derived from coal or from natural gas. In this country, it will be coal. not and I'll tell you what it is <coughs> and I'll tell you why it is. <coughs> it is not ethanol uh, because it's coming from, well, it depends where it comes from. If it comes from corn, I'm not interested. If it comes from uh, from uh, cellulose, I'm interested, but nobody's doing that very effectively. Uh, I think for India, the best thing is from Jatropa. Uh, oil from Jatropa. Now, why? Why now? You know, in 2006, uh, it was a big deal. Uh, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs said it's the next big thing and so forth. It was too early. Why? Jatropa had not been characterized. So, the type it's called, okay? They were not domesticated, it's called. <coughs> so, depending on which seed you got from where, the yield could be anything. Could be, see, Jatropa can get a yield up to 40%, 4-0. You know these, uh, and all these are no more than 28, 30 uh, percent. This is the yield, meaning you take a seed. How much is oil? <coughs> Jatropa can be that much, but with wild type, you never. Uh, one important thing: price has dropped by about ten, five orders of magnitude in the last uh, ten years. So you can sequence the genome so of Jatropa, and it actually has been sequenced. So for example, the human genome was sequenced between 1990 and the year 2000, took 10 years, and took uh, $2 billion. We can sequence your genome for 1,000 bucks, dollars, so 1,000 USD dollars, US dollars, in three days. 
So what, this is what the magic of uh, improvement of, uh, of sequencing, okay? Uh, something called the polymerase chain reaction allowed this to happen, okay? It was invented in 1991 and got the Nobel Prize within a few years, okay? Uh, <coughs> so I think what should happen is the tropa should be, actually it has been sequenced, somebody should take the sequence, figure out which gene is responsible for which phenotype it's called, which characteristic you want. So, and then uh, knock out the bad ones and produce a jatropa that is high yield, low water, whatever you want. You're in business. So, I, right now, the best thing in biofuels for me is genetically modified. Is the best suited for that because jatropa grows, grows well here. Uh, and somebody here in some part of the IIT, which I don't know yet, <coughs> can do the sequencing. <coughs> and then there's something called high throughput screening, which also becomes very cheap that, anyway. Anyway, the technology is now very much available to a genetically modified jatropa for oil seeds. Because the damn car companies don't want to do it, that's why. But there are two reasons. Okay, so he's saying in Brazil you can mix any amount of methanol and ethanol in the car. There, it's almost mandatory. Why is it not happening in India? We're not happening in the U.S. either. Uh, <coughs> you, need to do, you need to do two things. For ethanol, <coughs> your fuel lines have to be stainless steel. Okay. <coughs> but and then for methanol, additionally, certain elastomers have to go to a different elastomeric compound, okay, certain seals, okay. All of that adds up to about 100 US dollars, which considering the overall car, size of the car, the comp uh, company co car cost is not much. It's completely doable. In fact, in US Congress, there is sitting a bill called the, uh, uh, called the, I, know, yeah, I forgot the name of the bill, which says you can do exactly that. You can put any amount of any uh, methanol, ethanol, and you'll be fine. That bill is not passing. For some reason, the, the oil interests and or the automotive company interests don't want it to happen. It is better for the automobile if you do it the way I suggest, which is in fuel injection. It is okay for the automobile if you do it the other way. Because <coughs> On a purely calorific basis, both those compounds have fewer calories per gallon than gasoline. I would advise against that because you can sell sugar very profitable in the world market. Uh, let's not compete with sugar production. Uh, let us do methanol uh, from coal. Completely feasible. You first and then you. Yeah. Mostly because of the cost of aggregation, of collection. So there are two types of plastic. Basically, thermoplastics, you don't have to convert it into oil. You can just essentially reuse it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, uh, and, then and, and, and reform it. But other, you have to make it into the original oil. I think the two reasons, one is aggregation at least, that is probably the valid. One reason, whether it's valid reason or not, the probably the valid reason is people can't be bothered, that there's not enough incentives. <coughs> it's not to be done anywhere, not in the U.S. either. Forget India. Um, and in there, so it's 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 the same sort of thing like cooking oil. <coughs> if you've got uh, you know fr uh, you know a Kentucky Fried Chicken or something, that oil <coughs> can very easily be re reused through transesterification. Okay. It's not happening anywhere. Well, it's happening in little pockets in the U.S., but, uh, and mostly because of the cost of aggregation. Here, though, the cost of aggregation should be cheaper because labor is cheaper. Uh, I think it needs someone to push it.
On a fuel cell, what uh, raw material would you like to use? What fuel would you like to use for the fuel cell? No, 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 no. I mean, not the material. Uh, which, which fluid do you want to convert to? So you want to use hydrogen. Hydrogen fuel cells. Are okay, okay. So let's get back to your basic question. I think that. The battery cost has to come down to under two hundred dollars U.S. dollars per ampere hour. Okay, whatever that converts into rupees. Okay, uh, <clears throat> when it comes, if it does that, uh, electric cars will take off. If it comes under one hundred and fifty, it will really take off, and it's completely feasible. It will happen. Okay, I personally think it will happen just with lithium ion only. Okay, uh, and do something fancy with the anodes. Okay, the get. Uh, you know, some nanomaterials and nanodes or something. I, I think that's the way to go, okay? It may be more of a materials issue than a chemistry issue. Uh, but either way, that is the target. You've got to get to 150 to 200 USD uh, per ampere hour. Uh, ampere hour, what the hell is ampere hour? Per kilowatt hour, uh, too late. Uh, uh, per kilowatt hour to be cost effective. And I don't really care about the chemistry. You deliver me $150 a kilowatt hour, you're, you're, we're done. And uh, it will take off. Particularly also, then we need good government intervention. We want, we need that nighttime charging is cheaper. Okay. You know, in many places, nighttime the electricity is pretty much useless. Okay. Uh, in, in really, in many places. Certainly, the, the, it's very low value. And yet, everybody charges the same amount. Not necessarily, but so. There should be government intervention. We, we're not talking about subsidy here. We just allow the power company. And then all the charging should be done at night by the, by the, car, by the electric car. You know, all this idea of charging stations everywhere, it sounds good. Even some of your people are talking that language. But I personally think that it's not a good idea. Because charging during the day is just adding load, particularly to charge between you know, uh, one and four or something, it's a travesty. You're just loading it up. If you've got a charging station everywhere, at least maybe you put a lock on it between one and four, okay? Or you put the price sky high so that people don't use it. People should not be doing it. People should be charging at home. But then at home also, the pricing structure should be allowed to be cheaper at night. I mean, the, the cost, anyway. So if those things happen, electric cars, electric cars, I have a, I've written a book on shale oil and gas. By the way, if anybody wants it, ask someone, and I'll get you free PDF copies of it. Okay. In the book, I actually do a calculation of electric cars from mine to wheel. It's 60 percent more efficient than internal combustion engine. 60 percent more efficient, and calculate any way you want to uh, from the, from the mine to the wheel. So electric cars are not only about zero tailpipe emissions. Electric cars are simply more efficient in the whole chain. And most of it is due to the efficiency of the motor. It doesn't matter. It is very, it's very efficient. And I'm taking transmission. Okay. So electric cars are, uh, but they need better batteries. The amount I talked about, and good, need uh, allowing pricing variation like today. Uh, you are done. You are done. Okay. Is there anything else? Nice widget, you don't care, okay? No, I, I think that's good. 
consumers are the reason. Consumers are asking for it. They're asking for innovation in that space, in the in that whole space of communication between people, in selling that way and so forth. <coughs> Rarely do things happen if they don't sell. Obviously, this is selling. Okay. In fact, this is a complaint of uh, innovators in the space of making objects that venture capitalists are not interested in them. Okay. The multiples on companies that operate in this space of alcohol, for example, are enormous. In fact, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are multiples of non-profits. Okay. There, there are huge multiples when there is no profit at all. So what's the multiple at that point? Okay. Uh, it is you. The public wants the products, wants the soft products, prepare to pay for it, and therefore all the venture money is going into that. Now, will venture money going into, go into objects? Yeah, but it's harder. I advise a lot of people in, in, in that space uh, because for me, it's about processes or equipment, innovation in that space. Uh, it's harder, but it's available. It is available, but you can't, you can argue. It is, if the public wants, they get it. That's what the soft stuff is. <coughs> Are we all done? Uh, thank you, sir, for your insightful talk. He's pulling the rug. Okay. I would now like to call Mr. Narayanan, a, fe a fellow batchmate of a guest lecturer, to honor the guest lecturer with a memento.